It was an impressive lineup of the world's who's who. The mood was euphoric. More than 100 heads of state had gathered to seek common action to protect the planet. The earth was getting hotter and all seemed concerned. Eventually, they signed a treaty called the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. While the rich and industrialized nations agreed to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, the poor nations were asked to pursue economic and social development and poverty eradication. The convention said it was their first and overriding priority. The Earth Summit began with high hopes, but ended with broken promises. In the years that followed, emissions by the rich nations touched an all-time high. decided then to set Monday... More than 160 nations met again in the ancient town of Kyoto in Japan. We may find as we go through the this time, they adopted a treaty called the Kyoto Protocol. 38 rich countries, including the United States of America, agreed to legally binding targets to reduce emissions. The world hailed the agreement. The United States, the world's biggest polluter, walked out of the Kyoto Protocol. It said the treaty would damage its economy and was flawed since it did not include fast-growing economies like India and China. The rich economies of the world, which had made a commitment in Kyoto to cut down emissions, had increased them by 11%. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change warned that unless rich countries reverse their policies, catastrophic climate change is inevitable. Noted Nobel laureate Amartya Sen once described his land of birth quite interestingly. He said that for everything that is true of India, the opposite is also true. It was an apt summing up of a country that holds together many contradictions. Today India is one of the fastest growing economies of the world. It is a global leader in information technology and business outsourcing. Its towns and cities wear a new gloss of wealth and consumerism. And yet, this is only half the story told. The other half is about the lives of nearly 600 million Indians who face a blackout every night. They live without electricity. Their number equals the total population of the United States and the European Union. Lack of access to energy has hampered their lives in many ways. In the countryside, many children study in the light of an oil lamp. They have no chance of using a computer or having access to the internet. The women still use firewood for cooking, silently taking in the fumes. Often, they have no access to even basic health care. Without energy, India's millions have no hope of getting out of the trap of poverty ever. If their lives have to change, India has to use more energy. Its emissions will increase. But the rich countries of the world don't agree. 
They say India should first worry about global warming. Its poor can wait some more generations. We have nearly 80% of our population, more than 800 million people, who live below the globally accepted poverty line of $2 per day. Now, unless we increase our energy consumption, and it's not just the aggregate energy consumption, but energy consumption per head, there is no way that we can meet these development aspirations. So those of us who are suggesting that in order to address climate change, we need to forego development, we need to keep our people in poverty for several generations more, I don't think that they can be taken seriously. Despite their own remarkable legacy in polluting the planet, the rich countries accuse India and China today to be the biggest climate change problems. While India's per capita carbon dioxide emissions are 1.2 tons per annum, some of the developed countries score much higher. The countries of the Euro area stand at 8.2 tons, Japan and the United Kingdom at 9.8 tons. Norway at 12.5 tons, and the United States of America at a whopping 20.6 tons. The figures say it all. And yet, these rich countries argue that India should cut down its emissions further. We need to understand very clearly who has caused the problem, who is continuing to cause the problem, and who has primary responsibility to address the problem? The Framework Convention points out very clearly that there is a distinction between the responsibilities of the developed countries and the developing countries. That climate change is taking place not just due to current emissions, but climate change is taking place uh, really as a result of accumulated greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere, which is really the result of the pattern of industrial activity over the last couple of centuries. And so this is why it recognizes that there is a certain historical responsibility of the developed countries. And there is a responsibility for sustainable development of the developing countries. aspirations of its billion-plus people is India's tallest challenge. And yet, it has never been more bullish. Today, its economy is touching many green milestones. In the midst of the climate change crisis, India has grabbed the opportunity of building a clean and energy efficient economy. Thanks to the vigor of its people, it is getting there sooner rather than later. More than half of India's economy is powered by coal. But it is finding ways of curbing emissions from its thermal power plants. Over the last few years, many of them have adopted measures to become more energy efficient. India is also moving into the era of clean coal technologies. New power plants across the country are shifting to high-efficiency, supercritical technology, replacing the subcritical. In the years to come, even as India will scale up its power generation capacity massively, it is certain about one thing, that it will let coal come clean. Oh,
bird sanctuary is an unusual setting for a nuclear power plant. Located in the heart of northern India, the Naroda Atomic Power Station is surrounded by rich biodiversity. Today, India has 14 nuclear reactors in commercial operation that supply only 3% of its electricity. That's not surprising. Since 1974, when it conducted its first nuclear test, India has lived with severe embargoes. But undeterred by the isolation, its nuclear program has grown to become self-reliant. Indian atomic scientists have taken their research to a commercial scale of excellence. Despite the heavy odds, they have pioneered in the development of fast breeder technology. Using the same amount of uranium, the fast breeder can generate 50 times the electricity produced by a regular reactor. With India signing civil nuclear agreements with several countries, its nuclear program is on the fast track. By 2020, it is likely to exceed its target of tapping 20,000 megawatt from nuclear energy. The good news is that it will do so without polluting the atmosphere. On the easternmost coast of India, a group of a hundred islands exists in wilderness. The Sundarbans are home to the world's largest mangrove. Extending transmission lines through this web of swamps and rivers is impossible. The people here have lived without electricity for decades. And then, things changed. The sun lit up the quiet nights of the Sundarbans. Solar mini-grids brought electricity to thousands of homes and shops across the islands. By 2012, India has a target of electrifying all its unlit homes with solar energy. The drive has begun. From the deserts of Rajasthan to the hills in the Himalayas, solar technology is reaching places where the grid may not reach for decades. But the movement is not confined to the country's hinterland. Cities too are fast catching up. Bangalore, India's thriving IT hub, leads the pack. Solar water heaters shine from every rooftop. In the early 90s, the state government gave a smart incentive to its people to use solar technology. It gave them a rebate on their electricity bill. Happy with the savings, the citizens lapped up the sunshine with open arms. Today, the city saves 300 megawatt every day with a little help from the sun. across miles of hills and villages in western India, 
hundreds of windmills stand tall, generating more than 1,000 megawatt of electricity. Located in a little known town called Dhule, this is Asia's largest wind farm. In 2006, India overtook Denmark to become the fourth largest producer of wind energy in the world. The Indian company Suzlon ranks amongst the world's top manufacturers of wind turbines. A few years ago, it was a modest textiles firm. Today, it is setting up massive wind farms in countries like China and Australia. On the home turf, wind energy is being pushed zealously by the government. A friendly tax regime has made it a good investment opportunity for big businesses. Bajaj Auto Limited, India's leading auto giant, was one of the earliest investors in wind energy. Today it gets 90% of its power from the wind. Not surprising then that many other corporates have followed. India is tapping over 8,000 megawatt of wind energy, and this is just a start. On the edge of India's western shore, a million stars shine every night in a town called Jamnagar. Built by the Indian corporate Reliance Industries Limited, this is the world's most sophisticated oil refinery. Spread over an area that's one-third the size of Manhattan, it's not just the world's biggest, but also its most energy-efficient refinery. Right from the stage of design, its builders envisioned it to be a top ranker in energy efficiency. With ingenuity, they implemented a host of energy conservation projects in the complex. Today it has the lowest energy and loss index among all the refineries of the world. Having recently added to its capacity, the facility can now refine 1.2 million barrels of crude a day. Clean fuel processed here travels overseas to Western markets in the United States and Europe. Across every sector of industry, some of the world's most energy efficient units are located in India. Over the last decade, the average energy consumption of every big industry has declined sharply. Some outstanding examples are those of cement, steel, aluminium, and fertilizers. With new technologies, policies, and enterprise, energy efficiency is the new buzzword for Indian industry. The landscape of Bage Parli in Karnataka is deceptively beautiful. It betrays the poverty that lurks beneath. But recently, the villagers found a reason to smile. Earlier, women like Anjanama trudged the forest every day to collect firewood for cooking. But today, she is among the 5,000 women of Bage Parli who have a biogas plant in the backyard of their homes. This happened after a voluntary organization raised revenue for the project through the clean development mechanism. The idea worked. By using biogas instead of firewood, the women were helping save millions of tons of carbon emissions and were able to sell their carbon credits to a French company. 
Today, the women feel a sense of pride because they can cook as easily as women in the cities do. India today has a substantial middle class that is reaping the benefits of a growing economy. Over the years, this section of the population has moved to a better quality of life. But despite the new prosperity, most Indians live modestly. Compared to Western lifestyles, Indians have a much smaller carbon footprint. For example, in producing food and getting it to the table, India uses 0.1 ton of carbon dioxide per million kilocalorie of food energy. A developed country like the Netherlands uses 1.9 tons, Australia 2 tons and the United States 2.2 tons. India emits 16 grams of carbon dioxide per kilometre. The EU 15 emits 118 grams and the United States over 190 grams. India recycles nearly 70% of its waste. Germany recycles 47% and the United States just 30%. It's what many call the perverse reality of climate change. Those who have done the least to cause the problem will suffer the most. Floods and droughts are taking a heavy toll on India's poor. Most of them earn their living through agriculture. Unable to cope with climate change, they're struggling to feed their families round the year. Along India's immense coastline, millions of lives are at risk if the sea level rises. These are India's most vulnerable people. They have no access to any mode of communication, electricity or even clean water. India needs to develop fast so that its poor can have the resources to adapt to climate change. It also needs financial and technological resources from the developed world. At Rio, this was a commitment made by the rich countries. A commitment that remained largely on paper. Climate change is an elemental threat to humanity. If it is an extraordinary challenge that we are facing, 
then obviously we must come up with an extraordinary response. We must come up with a, a global and an ambitious response. So it is we who are arguing that Copenhagen must come up with an ambitious outcome. But you can't say that I want an ambitious outcome but not put together the kind of resources which are required, the kind of effort which is required in order to achieve that result. To give you an example, we already have a range of technologies which are available which could help in mitigating climate change. Okay, the solar energy is available, there are a number of other promising technologies which are really have come up uh, in the last few years. Now, if you really want a global impact, then isn't it logical that you should try and make certain that there is as rapid and as wide a diffusion of these existing technologies as possible. Okay, then that would make an impact. So what are we saying? We are saying, why don't you put such technologies in the public domain? You know, adjust the IPR issue so that these technologies can be very rapidly scaled up and can be distributed as widely as possible and have a global regime which also supports capacity building so that these technologies can be absorbed quickly. We are not rejecting the market, but market cannot achieve this. So when we put forward this kind of a proposal, people say very interesting, but they do nothing about it. In the summer of 2008, India launched its national action plan on climate change. It comprises national missions on issues such as solar energy, energy efficiency, and climate research. The plan lays out India's roadmap for achieving key goals in the context of climate change. I have already declared as India's Prime Minister that despite our development imperatives, our per capita greenhouse gas emissions will not exceed the per capita greenhouse gas emissions of the developed industrialized countries. This should be testimony enough if one was needed of the sincerity of purpose and the sense of responsibility we bring to the global task on hand. The Earth's atmosphere belongs equally to all human beings. It should not matter which part of the world they live in. India's poor cannot be denied their right to a dignified life. Their children deserve a better tomorrow. Regardless of the clamor of the rich world, India will continue to grow even as it fights climate change. It has more than a billion good reasons to do so.